This is the Fly Culture Podcast with me, your host, Pete Tigers. Welcome everyone to the very latest Fly Culture podcast. It's great to be back in Chalkstream country once more and to sit down with Howard Taylor from Upstream Dry Fly. I'm hoping, and my fingers are very tightly crossed, that we'll do a little bit of fishing afterwards. It's grayling season at the moment, so fingers crossed that um, we'll be able to hit the river afterwards. But it's great to be sitting down with you, Howard. Um, How's it going? Oh, it's lovely to be here, Pete, and I'm a big fan of the magazine. Um, and it's a breath of fresh air, something that I've really enjoyed reading your articles. So, yeah, lovely to, to be of assistance and be involved. Thank, thank you very much for the kind words. And um, it's been a real labour of love, I have to say. We've enjoyed doing it. We're over a year old now and it's been great fun. And I know when we had our first get together, actually, it was with on some of your fishing, wasn't it? And we caught some grayling, had a chat, put the world to rights. And I thought having had that sort of conversation with you that it would be really nice to sit down and learn a little bit more about working in fishing working on the chalk streams as well um, and learn a little bit about fishing the chalk streams because I know you have access to fishing which is um, traditional uh, would be regarded traditional chalk stream fishing but also the salmon fishing as well and as a salmon angler as well that's really interesting to me so hopefully we can touch on that um, at some stage as well a little bit further down the conversation but um, tell us a little bit about upstream dry fly well uh, upstream dry fly is as you know it's a sort of term um, that's uh, synonymous with the kind of unwritten rules of chalk stream fishing to give the trout a, a sporting chance not um dragging your wet fly downstream like some of those terrible sal- salmon anglers do oh. <laughs> myself included <laughs> yeah not me too so yeah it was a, and, th- and that just um seemed to fit quite nicely with what we were trying to do in as much as um provide a a, a portfolio of beats that are available to um fish on uh, for uh, predominantly for for brown trout using a dry fly, which is kind of what the chalk streams are famous for and where the sport began of dry fly fishing, I think. And how long have you been operating now? Well, I've been guiding on the river for crumbs. I mean, I've I've worked as a river keeper and guided on these chalk rivers uh, for you know a long time, thirty more than thirty years. Um, but upstream dry fly off the top of my head has been running for about 15 or 16 years as a company Um, and you know I've thoroughly enjoyed my wife and I were a sort of two-man band and you know we thoroughly enjoyed building um, an amazing clientele and it continues to be a periscope for me into another world you know fishing aside it it's fascinating to meet um all all walks of life through fishing and it, and it becomes a great leveler when you're guiding someone on the riverbank and you share a passion for you know flicking a fly basically it's really interesting just chatting to Anna when you were on the phone a little bit earlier and um, having now myself stepped back from guiding our, our business was very similar that I worked with my wife and really enjoyed it she's I always say she was the brains behind the operation Absolutely. took the bookings kept people away from me for as long as possible yeah and do you find working together enhances your relationship as well well most of the time yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no definitely I mean Anna's worked in the travel industry all her life she's been um you know a, a virgin air hostess cabin crew and she has worked for Sir Che Blythe with his round the world yachts she's worked for you know corporate jet companies so she's used to planning itineraries and double checking and triple checking everything and and so trying to avoid the dread of a double booked beat for example Mm. is something that fills us both with absolute you know horror Mm. and because all of the beats on the chalk streams or the majority of them are a sort of exclusive use basis so a, a, a fisherman or two or three will take a beat and they won't expect to, you know, they'll have that stretch of river X hundred yards to themselves for the day. Whereas if you fish 
in Scotland, for example, on a salmon river, you know, you, you may book an exclusive use beat, but you may also just take a day rod and be sharing, you know, with that sort of fishing etiquette where you mm. don't fish through someone's pool and so on. So there's a little bit of that, but most of it here is you take a beat for the day and a lot of people are traveling. So there's a travel itinerary, be they from America with the strong dollar at the moment, or be they from London, um, there's there's usually a hotel involved or maybe an evening meal or certainly a commute. Mm. So it's important to get to try and get it right to string all of those elements together. So you work with hotels and, and pubs and everything else as well, do you? Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah we're very package. lucky with, the, with our yeah. sort of hotel connections. And, you know, again, we see a sort of myriad different people come through the reception of, you know, X or Y hotel. Um, that some are brand new to fly fishing and see it on the sort of menu of, of what they can do while they stay or, and others are experienced hands and they're actually traveling to this destination specifically to cast a line on these kind of hallowed waters you know that's really interesting and rewinding a little bit you mentioned portfolio fishing and that must have been a really interesting yet I guess probably challenging thing in part of the setup to build I, I guess you started with one sort of beat and then sort of does it feed from there and then you you have feelers out or people are aware who you are and and then fishing comes a result of that and you're able to sort of grow the business that way organically or do you just... yes I mean it's all very much I think word of mouth and reputation you know that there, there's no kind of advertising or mm. cold calling or anything I'm, I'm a biologist by sort of training and I've worked um, on you know some uh, you know, quite large scale uh, river and wetland conservation projects. And, you know, off the back of that, you know, I've learned, f you know, both through the sort of river keeping friends that I, that I, you know, keep, um, you know, very close to my heart, if you like, you know, a lot of river keepers have, although they perhaps don't have that scientific knowledge, um, th you often find that their um, knowledge by experience you know, out trumps the ecologists or, you know, scientific data, or it absolutely mirrors it, you know. So I think managing a river over the seasons, over the years, it's very important to amalgamate the practical skills and experience of the river keeping fraternity with, um, you know, scientific data that perhaps shows things like the decline of salmon. We're talking about chalk stream salmon, you know, the, the life cycle of the salmon is only very, you know, only a small part within the river. So we need to be able to know about the, the, the trials and tribulations of salmon when they're in the oceans migrating as, as well to, to get, get a you know, complete picture of what is going on and why our salmon are in trouble. So using the skill of the keepers, but also the... the the skill of the scientists and marrying that together gives us a much broader picture and enables us to focus on our in-house backyard management of our particular pieces of river and for example we, you know with the river restoration project you know we might be looking at um, creating an inverted commas you know mangroves by putting woody debris in the river you know which gives those small fish somewhere to hide from the predators some of the traditional chalk stream management of yesteryear when the Victorians were keen on, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, taming, taming the river and taming nature, you know, rather than working with it, we, we, we tended to, uh, you know, treat our riverbanks like a billiard table and mm. mow them to within an inch of their life. Where, whereas now we're, we've gone about circle and, you know, great organisations like the Wild Trout Trust, for example, are, you know, spreading the word of how to manage a river for fishing, but also for the fish and the, all the life stages of the trout or the salmon. And that's the really important thing, isn't it? It's not, the river's not there for the fishermen, it's for the fish. And talking to you off mic as well, how passionate you are about the wild fish as well. And, and sometimes the chalk streams get a bit of a bad rap with heavy stocking and stuff like that. But it seems to me as though you're extremely passionate about wild fish and I guess your biology background plays into that really well yeah I mean from, from a from a I suppose a company b 
business point of view that's letting making money that's no holes barred about mm. it i mean our 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 livelihood is through letting chalk stream mm. fishing and all the all the add-ons that go with that guiding catering and so on but it's a balance with regards to wild trout because with the best will in the world if you're running a wild trout beat or a wild trout chalk stream fishery you can't fish it every day you've got day. to rest it haven't you? you've yeah. got to rest it yeah. um and otherwise it deteriorates you know you can't have that footfall and the river test you know it's only a 90 minute drive to the center of london so it's it the the potential footfall and the and the you know the the, the international catchment of people anglers that come here it's a busy river um very popular mayfly dates are sold out three years in advance wow. you know on some of the prime beats so we're in a dilemma really of the stocking versus wild fish how to balance that and you know how to make sure that what we do doesn't deteriorate from the you know the ecology of the stream that's the bottom line mm. and you know the ri this river the chalk streams have been stocked for donkey's years so to you know to draw a line under that and say no more stocking is very misleading um you know the the river the genetic uh stock from this river and from Loch Leven for example have stocked brown trout all over the world mm. you know all mm. of those from the Himalayas to New Zealand to the US you know everywhere that has brown trout pretty much other than Europe the fish have come from here you know mm. and so we've spread uh, you know and, and at that time Halford on his beat on the Oakley stretch right running right alongside that beat is a ditch that was his stew ponds mm. so the great grandfather of dry fly fishing stocked the river back in 18 what at 70 18 18 turn of the century so it's a it's a it's a tricky dilemma and we're seeing things that are uh, you know strange that you know we've now gone over to, for example to stocking strip um, triploids which is a genetically treated fish um to affect the sex chromosomes that makes it sexless and the idea is quite rightly i agree with the uh, the principle is you know it's to uh, ensure that the future genetic stock of the river only comes from wild Pure. fish so going forward the the more generations of wild fish that breed in these chalk streams will be genetically correct um but we, we are seeing on the downstream fisheries that we're very fortunate to be the stewards of, that a lot of these triploid fish that are stocked right out, up and down the river have a, I think, unforeseen, um, what's the word, calling to, to migrate downstream. So we're finding a lot of slob trout yep. right down in the estuary, which we never saw before. And are those fish competing with our migrating fish what are they eating mm. you know mm. are they you know for example the smolt run around easter time you know in the spring when the when the salmon smolts run silver up and run to sea you know i can't help thinking whether there's like a wall of stock waiting yes just showing down on those smolts mm. we don't know that's mm. the you know yeah. river keepers see things you know there's no very it's very difficult to scientifically uh, or very expensive and very difficult to scientifically uh, analyse that. But so again, we it sort of flips back round to relying on the river keepers and their observations. Coming back to stocking gate, it was interesting. I think it must have been four or five years ago at the Wild Trout Trust get together. They've just had one up in Dartmoor, but it was the previous one at Dartmoor. And they had somebody who'd done a scientific study of stocked versus wild brown trout. Yeah. And how we have this theory that wild brown trout um, would be pushed out by the stockies. But it was actually, I think they proved it was the other way around. Okay. And the wild trout trust, would, uh, the wild trout, sorry, would push the stockfish out. And they did stockfish versus stockfish. Uh, wild fish versus stock fish and how they reacted in an enclosed thing and the, the wild fish came out well, that's on good. top I believe anyway so I kind of remember that and I thought wow because you'd think 
these big bruisers would probably push the fish out, but no. No. School of hard knocks and everything. Yeah, exactly. I think, and it's a balance, isn't it? It's about getting it right. I think a carefully managed river, you know, we are fly fishers and we want the next generation of fly fishers to enjoy our sport. So to not have easier to catch stock fish would, I think, um, make it more difficult for with the pressure that we're under with pop remember you know the population isn't the number of fly fishers is not what it was in mm. halford's day mm. we're, we're you know we're a lot more although still quite a niche fraternity um so this river's only i don't know 40 miles long as, as a guesstimate wow. you know depending on how you measure it because it's braided and everybody exaggerates how much they own but um yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult one. If if you know if we want to teach, if I want to take my daughters fly fishing for their first lesson on a river or their first lesson after a lake and introduce them to a river, I would take them to somewhere where they're going to catch a fish, yep. and the chances are that fish is going to be a stock fish mm. without too much issue with back cast. And so us, you know, us our the technical fishing fraternity who love a challenge and can roll cast under an overhanging tree and all the rest of it we love our wild fishing but you know you have to start somewhere so it's a it's it's very much i think about you know to draw a line under stocking of rivers completely would i think damage our sport mm. it's interesting as well i don't know we'll, we'll come on to this and i'll fire this question at you now is how do you see the state of fishing and the reason i ask this is that I had a conversation with my friend Nick Hart the other day, and we were talking about numbers of anglers and how passionate, and it sounds like you're exactly the same about getting people into fishing. Yes. But I wonder, you know, they're saying that there are fewer people fishing. Do you think, you know, we had the Stillwater explosion, as it were, in the 70s, 80s? Yes. And that age group is coming to retirement plus age. Yes. So we're losing anglers there, but we're not picking them up further that, down the line. So yes. we had a greater mass of people fishing in that explosion. We're getting people coming into it. And in my view, there are people coming into it. And the social media, whether you like it or not, um, we're seeing people, young guys and girls, going out fishing, catching fish. It seems as though a lot of those, and it may be that I gravitate that way, go more towards wild fish in wilder places yeah but there are few of them because we've not had the explosion that we had previously Do, does that make yeah, any sense I to you is there I'd, a... I'd probably agree i mean when i grew up in that era we we're about the same age mm. i would guess mm. although you look much younger than me yeah <laughs> i'm much older <laughs> i would guess <laughs> um you know the still water the small still waters with legends like peter cockwell yeah. for example i mean i was very fortunate where i grew up i was taught by what i consider to be you know, um, the kind of great and good of fly fishing, Taff Price, Pete nice. Cockwell, Donald yeah. Downs, John Venyard, you know, and I worked in their shop as a sort of 10, 11 year old boy tying flies and, you know, s stuffing guinea fowl feathers in a, in plastic bags and mm. counting out hooks in dozens for sale, you know. So I was very fortunate and they, you know, those guys taught me how to cast and how to tie flies and Sadly, you know, they're, most of them are gone now. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, I relish passing that information on. And in those days, the likes of Avington, yeah. for example, you know, a clear water, spring fed, small lakes that reared these great big trout, to me, was the Valhalla. Mm. And I remember my first time being taken by Taff Price to Avington. And there's a f some photographs of me in the Trout Fisherman or the Trout and Salmon magazine in about 1980 or 77, I think, 80, early 80s, late 70s, you know, when I was, you know, a teenager or 11 or 12 years old. And it was just the most incredible, electrifying experience, still embedded in my memory. It changed my life, mm. you know, it's, it's what led me to study biology, it's what led me to wanting to work outside wanting to look after rivers wanting to you know be interested in wildlife conservation and put my shoulder behind nagging water companies to stop them polluting and extracting and 
abstracting and you know all of that sort of thing which I'm now involved in and passionate about was all stemmed from that early seed <clears throat> you know from 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 those from those people really and and yeah I don't know why the uh, the, the the popularity of small still waters seems to have waned which maybe it hasn't but I you know I'm I'm not in the area really where I are lucky enough to you know fish or guide on those uh those fisheries but I know you know a lot of our colleagues and friends who do and I, I and I you know I think that they 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 struggle they've gone past maybe their their absolute peak with people you know with diva springs and mm. you know they're still a, a very successful fishery but I you know I always felt that they were the kind of st the stepping stone if you like to you know, when you learn to play golf, you start on your, I'm not a golfer, but you start locally and then you maybe aspire to fishing on the River Test where a golfer would aspire to hitting around on a Lynx course at St Andrews or Carnoustie or Sunningdale or wherever. Mm. So for me as a kid growing up, the River Test was the absolute, mm. you know, mm. and I still remember to this day, the first time I ever fished on it with a chubber float and a maggot, yeah. God forbid, yeah. that was what, <laughs> Lost. That, yeah. that was what happened, <laughs> yeah. you know, before I was a fly fisher, yes. I was, you know, a course fisher, um, and, you know, I still pinch myself every day when I wake up and look at the river and mm. think, wow, you know, mm. this is where I live, you know, so very fortunate, mm. and, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I count my blessings. It's really interesting that you mentioned those people, and I know knew um, Donald a little bit. Um, I didn't know Taff, but I had his time books. Yeah, Pete Cockwell is one of my heroes, and I think it's really important. While these guys and Pete's got lots of life in him left yet, but to let them know, and I always let him know whenever I see him, whenever I speak to him, what an impact yeah. he had on me as a fly angler, and I managed to. He, I think he was slightly embarrassed at the time. I fished Diva Springs with him once. Yeah. And this is before phones. And I had my photo taken with him. And my wife got it blown up. And she sent it off and oh. got him to sign it. And it meant that much to me. I remember he did a Stillwater video at Avington. Yes. Uh, oh, it was Stillwater Stalking. So it had Chalk Springs on there. Yes. It had Avington. All those sorts of places. And it had a massive impact on me as a stillwater angler and watching him fish and being able to fish him and uh, fish with him and, and meeting these people and, and what they've done. And I don't think they always realise what an impact they've had on, on people. And I've, I always try and tell them whenever I see them, Charles, whoever, what they've done to me yeah. as an angler. And I think it's, it's really important to let them know, I think. I agree. I very much agree. Charles is, yeah, absolutely another one. He's been, you know, a kind of, you know, we've we've crossed fly rods over the years in in sort of, you know, business and person, you know, a lot. And I've got a great deal of respect. Mm. And Taff, you know, I hadn't seen him for forty years, and I bumped into him and had a pint of beer with him at the first London mm. fly fair, and it was just amazing to see him. I was so pleased, and mm. saw him at the last one as well. Mm. You know, Madeline, it was amazing. And they live a long way away, and and I remember <laughs> sitting at his round fly tying table in Westrum in Kent. Yeah, and he he were you know he took on a whole youth of a whole group of youths with regards to fly fishing. And how we didn't drive him to well, that's probably why he you know he enjoyed a pint and a, <laughs> a, 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 a smoke of his pipe so much. But you know, he. I remember distinctly, list, you know, having to be quiet because we were listening to the w Wales playing rugby on on the radio, and you know, I had an order of uh, you know, twenty four mallard and clarets or something to tie to, tie for somebody. So I'm sitting there, you know, at the vice tying some flies, and you know, I finished the flies and was waiting for my next kind of instruction, and I decided to clean out his pipe with, <laughs> with the dubbing needle. <laughs> And I thought I was cleaning out all this horrible black goo, and actually it was the Meerschaum lining of his pipe, oh, his favourite <laughs> pipe, which you know still to this day I'm enormously embarrassed about. So uh, 
you know, his face when I when he see, when he seen what I'd done was not <laughs> not good at all. Do you think as well? You you talk about working in fishing tackle shops and places to hang out and, uh, as a youngster. We don't have so many tackle shops now, do we? So that's no. harder to do as well, isn't it? And it's a harder way to get exposure to to fishing. Yes, it was always quite electrifying, wasn't it, to go into whether you're a course fishing kid or t- you know. I mean, I used to get the bus. Or ride my bike to the tackle shop and then spend ages in there saying, have you got these swivels or those hooks? Or, you know, when I went through my carp fishing phase or my centre pin trotting, trying to catch a barbell fishing phase or my mm. trout fishing phase, you know, how, how, can, how can I get on the train to get from here to the river or from here, you know, without before long before I could drive a car? Mm. Um, and you know, going into your, you know, the preparation—it's a man thing. I think. That's part of it, isn't it? It's That's massively, yep. you know, the preparation. You were saying, you know, about um, getting ready for a trip. We were talking about, you know, sometimes you lay all your rods, and you know, and that is a big part. I need my bonefish flies. I need some fluorocarbon. I need a seven weight, an eight weight, a nine weight, a ten weight, an eleven weight, <laughs> and a six, and a six. <laughs> yeah, just in case it's not wind. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Um, yeah, and now you can't, you haven't got that interface because mm. it's very much either sort of mega stores, the Sports Fish and the Glasgow Angling, or which you would, you know, unless you live nearby, you wouldn't, you'd make a special trip to, or it's the internet, isn't mm. it? Mm. So I agree for the youngster to go and sort of poke about in a tackle shop, which was always a is is a thing of yesteryear. Yeah. Yeah, there's not so many. I'm lucky. I've got one in Crediton, and I can go in there and bum a cup of coffee and have a chat. And it's a real Aladdin's cave of fly fishing stuff. But there's not so many of those around to be able to do that. And also thinking about fishing, and I often mention it on the podcast of the, the um, Bernard Venables, Mr. Crabtree in National Press. We don't have that sort of thing to to make fathers think about taking their sons or daughters or mothers taking sons and daughters fishing. One silver lining, I think, and has been fabulous, is the Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer TV program. I was going to say, we've got Paul and Barb. That has, been, <laughs> that has just Paul. been... And I, yeah, I I watch that, and it's such a great advert for fishing. It is. And I hear they've got a third series as well, um, which is brilliant. And people I know who don't fish say, wow. You know, yeah. and the, there's the other program, the guy, um, uh, Robson Green. Yes. So I've got a lovely story about that, that how fishing is promoted. I've not really watched his program, so I don't really know a great deal. But I was going to take a group down to Belize, bone fishing. And we were due, we'd had snow in Devon, and I was due to drive up to Heathrow the next day, and I found my truck had a puncture. Oh. And I phoned up my local... Um, tired people and said I'm in real trouble I've got a puncher I've got to drive to Heathrow da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, can you help me out they said absolutely bring your truck in now so the lady on the reception was talking because I'd spoken to her on the phone she said where are you going and I said Belize she said what are you doing and I said bone fishing uh, no sorry I said I'm going fishing she said what bone fish oh and I said wow how do you know about bone fish and she said Robson Green. Right. So these things are sort of Spreading all in the, the background. Word. And the, I, I think the White House and Mortimer thing has done it even better. Yeah. Um, and exposed people to fishing. And I, I look at things, TV uh, forums and things after it's been on, just to see what people say. And people are saying, this is making me want to fish, which it, is really cool. I've been very lucky with regards to Paul Whitehouse. He, you know, I'd say he was a mate, if you like. Yeah. And I've, you know had a few experiences with him we we uh we kind of we uh, um we were asked to put together a panel to discuss the over abstraction um you know the drying out of the chalk streams if you like but also fergal sharkey is a big proponent mm. of if you follow him on twitter or yes. on social media um and so but paul i asked him if if he would come uh, up to country country file live which is the big uh country file event uh, up at Blenheim along with Charles Rangley Wilson and they both di- didn't even think twice they both said we'll do Brilliant. it and we sat as a in a theatre um, and basically we were interviewed um, with regards to the you know the, the the plight of the chalk streams and how some of those especially 
the you know the uh, Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, the chalk streams that are the smaller, less sort of uh, well known ones are in well they're dry. Mm. You know yeah. these last two summers they've yeah. been absolutely dry. Mm. So it, it's a plight that definitely needs a a bit of uh, media exposure because I don't think most general members of the public have any idea that we are in the you know the southeast of England is drier than per capita than the Middle East mm. you know there's some quotation that is you know it, it says you know that the, the southeast of England per capita is 20% drier than the you know the Middle East which mm. is bonkers wow, when you're right. talking about a desert mm. and and we you know we uh, we have had national water companies which had abstraction licenses that were issued to them because they were a national body but those licenses which had have a very high upper limit have been passed on to the private companies during privatization so thames water have inherited or southern water have inherited a license that hasn't been rewritten from a national body to a private company and the private company's remit is to ensure that their shareholders are receiving a hefty dividend dividend mm. every year you know so we have no the bizarre thing is we on the in the southeast of england and i say southeast down to east dorset from kent and up to hertfordshire you know around london we don't have any new winter storage facilities no reservoirs so all of our with this massive increase in house building you know x million homes by x year in the future where's all the water going to come from the water companies you know and then you know i'm moaning down here uh, because i'm a gnarly old sod about the two dry summers that we've had and how the rivers are on their bones and I'm watching the news and seeing those poor people up mm. country who mm. having their home washed away, mm. you know. And it, it just seems bonkers to me that we are not, you know, we don't have a network of water across the country where these water companies are not all joined up. What's going on? You know, we've got individual succinct water companies that aren't talking to each other. They aren't sharing water. There is no network. So in the south, we've got no water. And in the north, the, the, you know, they're having mass floods. You know, we've just got to sort it out as a you, country. You, you think about, actually, I was just thinking about that and the political aspect of it. They're building this HS2. Wouldn't it be nice to put some pipes, either get rid of that or put some pipes down the side of that yeah, as they're digging would, everything up? It, it would make sense. Mm. And, and one of the biggest challenges we've had is that water companies don't want to buy water from a neighbouring yeah. water company because it's more expensive than you know, absolutely hmm. smashing the, our natural resources, you know, and, and applying for a drought permit so they can pump below the minimum residual flow at the bottom of their licence. You know, so they're basically pumping free water from their own reserves, but hammering our natural environment, our rivers, rather than trade across an arbitrary boundary with a next door water company who may have excess water. Mm. It's just bonkers. And the quicker the government wake up and make that happen, you know, the, the quicker our, you know, to see those photographs and film clips of beautiful rivers in Hertfordshire God. and Cambridgeshire that are absolutely dry and talk to people that say to me, you know, I used to fish that river as a kid. And now look at it, it's, it's, it's just dry because Affinity Water or Thames Water or whoever the water company is are, you know, unregulated by the Environment Agency. They're literally pumping the river dry. Mm. I remember, that, you know, this has been going on quite some time and I know people like yourselves who are in the centre of it have felt this for quite some time. And I even remember those bumper stickers, Wessex Water sucking the life out of Chalk Stream since whenever it was. Yes. And that must be six seven years ago that Absolutely. people were aware of that do you think the problem and i know we touched on this when we um last met and we talked about sewage treatment works which i've banged on about many times but do you think that we're not enough of a mass to 
lobby these people. I know the work Fergal's doing and, and everything else is, is bringing it and somebody like that being behind it. Do you think, and I, I know when we talked about it, I was getting a little excitable, but feeling, do we need to be going to AGMs and things as a group of anglers to make people aware of what's actually happening? Yes. I mean, I think, you know, each person should do their own bit you know put their shoulder behind it really mm. and there are you know and, and Fergal is a great example you know he has a lot of experience on um, gesturing with government through the music industry and the amazing stuff he did and he's still doing there so using <clears throat> and he's passionate about rivers and mm. fly fishing mm. which so we're really lucky to have him in our gang and so using his experience and his connections and and so on with getting word to government and also you know the top executive tiers of water companies the environment agency you know the secretary of state those sort of people Fergal somehow manages to mm, get a engagement. line into whereas you or I would no. yeah. we, we would if we'd be lucky to get in touch yeah. with their executive office and get a thank you but no thank yeah. you email you know so yeah, he, 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 I would just encourage everybody to keep an eye on what he's doing and to, you know, the one organisation I've found to be, I don't want to say head and shoulders above the others, but much more proactive above the others is the Angling Trust um, and their um, legal department, Fish Legal, who, you know, I've been a member of for some years on the various fisheries that, as I say, we're lucky enough to be stewards of the bits of river. And if and it's basically an insurance program, you pay them so much money um, a year to be a member of Fish Legal and you will get the legal advice. Should you have an incident, pollution incident or a neighborhood, you know, neighboring dispute or something, you've got you can pick up the phone to Fish Legal and they will help you, guide you and even give you, you know, legal support. I mean, they have for us to you know, to fight the, the rights of the Water Framework Directive and so on against a, a water company and the Environment Agency, they've actually supplied a barrister. So you can imagine the, um, you know, which we, in inverted commas, won, you know. So it, 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 the value for money is it's just in another stratosphere. You know, on the few hundred pounds we have paid over the years to be members each year, you know, to... to for them to shell out fees for a barrister is just, you know, and it just shows you that they're the membership of the Angling Trust is a powerful body mm. and they are not afraid of getting in at the, you know, at the sort of pointy end mm. of, whereas, you know, some of the other organisations will very much uh, back away from direct conflict and they don't like to. Mm. And then you start to dig a bit deeper and you find, you know, that some of the uh, wildlife trusts or some of the NGOs are actually funded the water companies by the water that, companies. Yeah, yeah, hand up their skirt. Yeah, so yeah. you get yeah. this conflict of interest mm. starting to appear where, mm. you know, you're, you're right at the point of saying, come on, you've got to help us. We, this is such a really good cause. We've got to stop this happening to this river. And then you sort of suddenly see a few people, a bit like the fret. No, I shouldn't say that. You know, <laughs> start to start to you know disappear off the battlefield, and you mm. think, hang on a minute, where have they gone? And mm. then you realise that because they are maybe they you know they may have a small team of employees, and that that financial backing from, for example, one of the water companies may or may not be I don't know the make or break for that you can't afford to lose can you, you can't. And these guys can employ hugely and I remember you telling me a story a, a year or so ago you know they have very expensive barrister and it's very hard to compete with them and I suppose that's the issue and coming back to what Fergal <clears throat> said about you know he doesn't pull any punches does he no he says how it is and that's sometimes how you've got to do it haven't you to get somebody like him who has the profile that he does I, it is mm. i agree and, and it's very difficult you know the local environment agency here are amazing the fisheries team are incredible but and they do a lot of fabulous work and to criticize them is, is difficult mm. however 
you know, the environment agency is a, you know, they are a slice in a very, a very thin slice in a, in a big environment agency organisational pie. Mm. And the rest of the environment agency, in my opinion, are not doing what they should be doing. You know, it is absolute madness. Have you seen the recent, you know, graphs over the last week of how little uh, independent um, water analysis the Environment Agency are now undertaking? You know, they, they've, they've dropped off their actual sampling points by 50, 60 percent. I don't know. I haven't got the, the data in front of me, but. You know, for, compared to 10 years ago, the Environment Agency were going to all the sewage outfalls and sampling the phosphates and nitrates and nasties. And they were much more of a, I understand, a regulatory body. Now, they, you know, I've come up against this directly and, they, and I say, well, who is actually sam you know, sampling of, from the outfall of that industrial estate? You know, there, there's an industrial estate of X hundred acres of concrete with lorries and diesel pumps and chemical plants and so on and so forth that when it rains the the wash off of that big concrete mm. pad over you know an enormous industrial estate goes straight into the river test mm. and who is monitoring that mm. you know and and then you find out that that outfall is owned by a water company and then you ask the environment agency after you've your river keepers and friends and you know uh concerned individuals have reported the outfall of, of that industrial estate uh, you know 50 times phoning the pollution hotline at the environment agency you know and they come out three days later after the rain has subsided and they say oh we didn't find anything and you've got video footage of the river flowing with foam mm. and smelling of diesel 20 mm. yards away it's, it is cr crackers. And then you, they say, oh, it's a water company owned facility and the water company do their own. We, we tell the water company to do their own outfall monitoring. Mm. <laughs> and you're like, what? You yeah. just find that water company. You know, yeah. the secretary of state has just find that water company X million pounds. You know, and then you find out the water company is budgeting. It's much cheaper for the water company to budget for the fines. It's running cost, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Rather yeah. than put a new network of, you know, replace the network of Victorian sewers that are all leaking. Mm. You know, they'll they'll budget for the fines and they'll send in diesel tanker lorries to pump out yeah. the excess when it's yeah. wet. Yeah. And I think I've said this before, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're having the expansion in the country of more housing and the lack of investment in the infrastructure. Yes. That's where it need, and it's got to be, and I'm sure this will happen, that the fines have to get big enough that the water companies invest rather than pay yes. the fines, like you say, as a, as a running cost. I hope so. I mean, it, you know, uh, there, there is definitely a building, uh, you know, a building support and the public are becoming mm. more aware, I think. And, you know, we, we, these chalk streams are our rainforests. Mm. You know, we have 85% of the world's chalk streams in this country, you know. So if, if we lose them, which we are, if we lose them any faster, some mm. of them we've lost, mm. you know, to, to hear people coin a phrase recently, you know, one of the water company or the environment agency executives said, you know, of a dry river, it's it's not dead, it's just sleeping. Mm. You know, you, you're like, how dare you? Mm. You know, that's my children's and my children's children's. You know, that's part of our natural heritage. Mm. That mm. is something that you, you know, those sort of people should be lined up and yeah there are you know my friend account. luke will be listening to this he's working at the a now and he's brilliant in his little sphere as well and come on working. luke sort it out yeah he will i reckon <laughs> if anyone can he can is deeply like yourself and myself passionate about the habitat of fish and i know he's pushing hard his side from the inside and doing um you know he's he he does work really hard on it so is he fisheries team uh, I think he's off that now. He started there and he's just moved off wow. to another department. But um, he's hugely passionate Fabulous. and he's trying to do stuff about it. So let's come back to the river again then and, and talk about the chalk streams this year. How's the season been? Yes, I mean, a couple of tough summers, you know, low water, low flows. Um, but ironically, you know, low water provide, you know, low water at this time of year which is spawning season for our salmonids, the trout and the salmon and sea trout, 
Um, you know, provides low silt loading, which is good for reds and egg survival. You know, what you don't want is a blanket of silt smothering your living red. That's exactly what Luke was saying to me actually the other day we were chatting. He said silt, silt, silt. The, Silt's the a killer. Yeah. yeah, especially silt that's full of nasties. You know, it tends to hook up with, you know, various pollutants as well. Um, so you, ironically, you do find sometimes with the data shows that, that, that low flow years can be within reason. I'm not talking about dry rivers, obviously, or, you know, rivers that are so low flow. But a lower flow, should I say, can be, in some cases, better spawning years. Um, so better recruitment of fry and so on. Um, but your, to go back to your question of how's the fishing been, we've had two, yeah, we've had two very good mayfly seasons. And I think, you know, it's nice to see the fly life starting to creep back as well. You know, we've, we, you know, the river fly surveys have come up you know what with gently encouraging suggestions that our river fly life on the chalk streams is coming is coming back it's you know i think farming and abstraction and all of the other sort of pins in the you know the doll of of chalk stream ecology are are have you know definitely seen but we've you know we've done a lot of work over not we I mean not, you know um, but in general now the environment agency as I say locally are spearheading um, a lot of restoration work on the chalk streams they're pulling out impoundments and trying to get rid of those silty areas and um, you know as long as those works are in keeping with in my opinion the very historic uh, fishing that we have here and you know part of our historic heritage our natural heritage is for the americans for example to come and see a thatched cottage or a mill on the river you know as a kid when you read mr crabtree you know the the most incredible place to go fishing was in a mill pool right you know where there was an impoundment that was the spot that you would make a beeline for on a river because it's the fishy spot but actually so, you know, when we're pulling out these impoundments, we need to, I think, be, you know, I completely agree with it, but I think we, we need to be mindful that, you know, we, A, we, we lose the control of the flow of the river through taking out some hatches, which in certain cases can be really helpful if you need to squirt a bit more water here or move a bit more water there without having that available in the future. But B... You know, I wouldn't like to see all of the mill races and the water meadow sluices and things like that gone because this is not a wilderness. These chalk streams are man-made. Yes. Yep. And, you know, in the British Isles, we don't, the flow country in the north of Scotland aside, we really don't have wilderness. Mm. We are a land that has been touched by the hand of man. And so we have to work with that, I mm. think. And, you know, nature... It has evolved here in conjunction with man over the last, you know, thousands of years. Mm. So we're never going to go back to. So the it scares me a bit when I hear the extreme conservation uh, unit, you know, fraternity yeah, talking about to, rewilding yeah. and you know introducing beaver and things like that. That yeah. worries me. You know, we've seen a, you know, when you're talking about top predators mm. or like a beaver, a keystone species, you know, you've got to be very careful to make sure all the other dominoes are lined mm. up. Mm. You know, we've seen the otter population come back amazingly here. But, you know, we've, we've also seen at the same time the uh, water quality and water quantity diminish dramatically. So... You know, an otter or a cormorant or a heron or, you know, is a predator. Mm. And if we're trying to maintain our stocks of wild trout or grayling or precious, precious salmon par, we, re we really need to be mindful of, you know, introducing top predators could have a catastrophic knock-on effect for the stuff that's going on below the water. Mm. 
and you know that's something that I I you know people are very passionate about when mm. you talk and you do get this very entrenched blinkered view don't mm. you where yeah. you know you get the otter guy talking about the otters or the beaver guy talking about the beavers and actually they don't see the full holistic yeah sometimes so that's a very valid point yeah the big pictures the big pictures so important you touched on there you said about wild fish and grayling and i wanted to ask you about grayling because it's been extraordinary how that has exploded over how long will we say now 15 years yes is that because people want to extend their season is it because they want to catch wild fish is it a combination what do you think it is oh, you know that's another, is it techniques as well it's another mm. it, yeah i mean it's another tricky one for me um it is a tricky you know so you remember the days when the old colonels and you know old school fly fishers were would catch a grayling and throw it over their shoulder in the stinging nettles you know i mean frank sawyer invented the killer bug to get rid of thin the grayling yeah. out of his beloved river Avon. Dear, I may have mentioned this on another podcast. Apologies if I did, but the wonderful, wonderful Ron Holloway um, told me a story of him and Frank Sawyer fishing the Avon. They dug a trench, yeah, and they put the killer bug and pheasant tail on, yeah, called grayling. Is grayling this for his run of the- beans? Yeah, no, I assume so. Yeah, okay, and yeah. They, the grayling went in the trench and they covered it over. I think, he, and then he planted runner beans. Wow! Yeah, yeah. So and that was amazing sort of... how that's changed and and how the grayling has become a fish. Obviously, up country as well and further north, that grayling have been a really important um, species up there to fish for as well. But it it seems that the chalk streams it's been a not slower, but a different path for them and, and it, it seems to me that explosion I mean explosion I think mm. in the last few years that everyone's wanting to try and catch it, a, it, it I suppose it makes it more affordable as it, well it does mm. so here's my appeal to our fellow fly fishers you know when you are grayling fishing you, you know especially if you're wading I mean I would say only wade if you absolutely have to mm. because you know, crunching over a uh, wild trout red with a pair of corker wading boots is not ideal for those eggs. And, you know, sometimes those reds aren't as obvious to see as you might think, especially if you're focusing and concentrating on your grayling fishing. It's a bit of colour in the water. It's very, you know, so I, my mind, you know, is, is a little bit, you know, one side of me, I love my grayling fishing, but equally... I, you know, one occasion a few years ago, I saw three guys lined up abreast and I actually yelled at them and said, what the fuck are you doing? Because they were wading right over a really beautiful trout spawning area that looked like, you know, an underwater moonscape. There were so many pots mm. <laughs> that the trout had created mm. as reds. Mm. And, it, you know, it was after the trout had finished spawning, so there were no trout there, but you could still see the the uneven bottom gravel bottom of the river and these guys were lined up triple mm. abreast fishing you know nymphs under indicators trying to catch the grayling crunching their way quite you know didn't and didn't have a clue mm. so you know when you're grayling fishing you are <clears throat> sort of out of season fishing often mm. you know if you're if you're buying cheap grayling winter grayling fishing um I was lucky enough to have fished on the same uh, beat as John Goddard for many years, and all John he John would pay his season rod on this particular bit of water um, for trout fishing, uh, but he would just spend his time catching the grayling. You know that's what he wanted to catch, and he flies. He's you know a lot of his olives with the with the shuck. You know yep. the exuvi yep. tide were focused on trying to get grayling to come up for a little Mm. blue winged olive you Mm. know a crippled olive um so that's my first you know when you're when you're fishing the chalk streams especially for grayling be mindful that there's trout reds and you you know we really shouldn't be wading Mm. in the middle of the river you know Mm. putting a leg in here and there to get the Mm. cast is good Mm. and secondly i have seen a lot of as you know as a somebody letting and having a company with regards to chalk stream fishing in the last few years there's been quite a surge of grayling anglers <clears throat> that are 
buying their grayling fishing out of the trout season, but they're basically trout fishing. They're not focusing on catching grayling. They're, 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 you know, I see people holding f- pictures of trout out of the water, out of season. It's not right. Mm, you know, that's yeah. it's, grayling fishing shouldn't be an excuse to catch out of season yeah, trout. No, absolutely, I'm with you on that. <clears throat> um, and I think, um, you know, it's a chalk stream, you should mm. be able to see the fish in theory. Yes, absolutely. It's, I know you it's should. not always easy, but you should. But, yeah. You should. And, and you know, the, the, the you know, the, the great sort of technical grayling fishermen, you know, with the invention of the, you know, the French leader and Czech nymphing and so on, you know, the, uh, you know, the likes of Howard Croston, who's taught me, you know, uh, being, you know, a keen con- mm. competition fisher and a mem- member of the England team, you know, he's enormously dexterous, procky as well, mm. you know, with their, you know, deadly, I would yeah. say. And they could, you know, I joke with Howard and he says, oh, I'm going to come and empty, you know, he calls me a lily livered southerner mm-hmm. and he said, I'm going to come and empty your river. And he probably could, you know, because he is so efficient. He would, you know, come grayling fishing, especially if you can see the river, see the fish, he, mm. he will catch and catch and catch. It's interesting as we get older, um, how your motivation isn't numbers. I agree. It is everything sitting down here as we were doing earlier talking about fishing drinking good coffee company of friends yes letting someone else have a shot at a fish and it changes i think as you get older i think there are good aspects and i always bring it up and bad aspects i worry about social media and that need to show those pictures as somebody uses it um but I think about how the fish are photographed, but I don't want to empty a pool. And when, you know, I've just stopped. I was joking. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, but what I was saying, you know, somebody like these are superhumans in that sense that they probably could, but I've got to the stage now where even when I was guiding, if I'd caught two or three fish out of a pool, yes, let's move on. Yeah. We don't want to. And I know Howard and I know exactly what you're saying about him. And he wouldn't. I know that. Well, but, but if he's but, fishing a competition, yes, they were. Yeah, he needs to because yeah. he's he wants yeah. the gold medal, which is yeah. you know representing our country, right? Mm. So mm. there's a different. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I I can't get it. I I don't understand competition. I have to, and I, I'm not saying competition fly fishing. I just don't understand competition. I like to fish because it's not competitive, but that's the way I see it. Oh, I'm the same. Yeah, you know how many have you caught? I don't know. Yeah, no. You know, three or four. Yeah. You know, it's one of those. I don't yeah. really count yeah. the num. You know, the numbers. I'm yeah. the same. Exactly that. And yeah. you know, I think that sort of restraint thing was all. You know, it, it was always something that those kind of forefathers, if you like, those the great and good guys, in, it, you know, basically imparted on me. You know, you you might have an evening where there is an, um, you know, <clears throat> where where there is a you know, an incredible sedge hatch, or you might be fishing, be lucky enough to fish in the middle of the peak mayfly, you know, when the duns are just hatching off and the trout have switched onto them. And you could, you know, and you sometimes look in a fishing book and you see, you know, Fred Bloggs, fabulous day, 27. Mm. And you think, 27, mm. really? You know, mm. go and have a beer, mm. you know, or go and try and catch that one under mm. that overhanging branch. Mm. That's that's me. Yeah, no, but, I'm. Similar, but if yeah. you rewound me back to when I, I was been, 22, yeah. I'd have been writing 37. <laughs> well, it was funny. My friend Ray and I we used to <clears throat> almost run to the river, putting on our waders and stuff yes. like that. But we didn't count. I don't think. But we belonged to a fishing club. We both, and we always put six in the book. Okay. No matter what. Yeah. <laughs> and it was always six. Skew the data. Yeah. Yeah. It probably. <laughs> it's a bloody night. Nightmare. Then I'd come along latterly and do demonstrations. Said, "Well, why are you having him along? You never caught any fish, no. you know." Um, but I think I'm now. It doesn't. I'm. I'm like you. It has to be the one under the tree, or I'll wait for the riser. Yes. Or I'll do this, and I'll do, and I brought along my Euronymphing kit to fish with. But I also bought, you know, a rod that I might just fish an upstream nymph. Yeah. To see how it goes. Yeah. And watch the leader and stuff. You know, just trying to make it different, interesting. And for me, that's what makes me keep 
coming back. And when I fish on my own, it might just be I'm going to target rising fish, which in Devon we don't always get consistent rises, but I'll target just those, or I might just roll cast every cast just to make things yeah, interesting mix it up a bit. to do stuff like that so, rather than saying I've got to catch. Can let me ask you a question? Go on then. Then. Flip it round. What what is your thoughts on? Um, and we're talking about stockfish here. So mm. for me, you know, catch and release is is mandatory in my mind mm. on anything wild. Mm. Um, you know, I wouldn't take a grayling to eat. Although some people, yeah. I wouldn't take a sea trout to eat, no. and I definitely wouldn't at the moment take a salmon. Yeah. You know, from from anywhere. Yeah. But I would take a stock trout, and I think it's important personally that we are hunter gatherers. Mm. You know, we I, keep uh, that intact. Yeah, yeah, I I got very upset recently that I'm potentially no longer allowed to go and shoot a couple of wood pigeons for me to you know fry the breasts and mm. make a warm wood mm. pigeon breast salad mm. you know that's for me you know somebody has kind of taken away my right to walk through a piece of wood that I have shooting rights on and to shoot a couple of pigeons and you know and equally with a track with trout fishing I, you know I'm if I'm honest I'm not a massive trout flesh fan you know i don't but i do like a hot smoked mm. trout mm. and i do like some other recipes with you know so i do take an occasional fish so i just wondered if it's a stocky uh, you know and, and it's sustainably reared you know to put into the river to be taken out again that is to me squares the circle and i just w- 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 i think that's a really fair comment and given we, we probably haven't got time to to go into this right now but given what we're hearing about salmon farms and learning about salmon farms yeah that's probably a better way to eat fish i'm like you there's so many people who are flying because don't like eating trout no i'm one of them yeah Um, i would have i'd say i wouldn't take a a salmon exactly the same if i had a school peel pound pound and a half i very very rarely take take them if it's in the rules and people don't abuse it though, and they want to take an odd fish, and on our streams, you mm. know, say you're allowed to take a 12, 13 inch fish, you took one. I don't really have an issue with that. If only Turbot lived in the chalk stream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have that big an issue with it. And if you wanted to eat trap, that's probably a better thing than buying farmed salmon in a supermarket. Oh, absolutely, um, isn't it? So, yes. And, you know, I was talking again, coming back to the conversation I had with Nick, that at the fishery he was running, that you would get people who would go along there and go and buy a fish in effect. They'd catch it, throw it in the... They weren't fishermen as such. Yes. But it was a more interesting way of buying their trout. Right. So pick your own. Yeah, sort of thing, isn't it? That's what I still want to... So I don't have that big an issue. I don't tend to take fish mainly because... Um, I don't really eat them, but um, we used to, when we used to go and fish Emma and I in the Devron, we took her first salmon. Yeah. And we celebrated it. We took one. Yeah. And then we stopped taking those. Um, Devon, we don't take any of the salmon there. I've had odd occasions where a trout may have taken a salmon fly or whatever, and it sadly not made it. Yeah. And I thought, well, at least I can do it. That's probably happened. I know it happened one night I was sea trouting and I spent ages trying to revive it. It clearly wasn't going to make it. And so I thought the least I could do was eat it. Oh, great. I sulked for a couple of days, um, but I did because I thought I had to do, that was the correct thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I don't know that we should be, you must not take a fish. And if it's allowed to, I, you know, we always try with beginners to say, look, we recommend you put the fish back. Yeah. And our fish are pretty small. But then there's the other, and you being a scientist is much smarter than me, that if you took, a, let's say, a 14-inch fish out, that's probably better than taking a 10-inch fish out, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, I mean, it depends where and how, but you mm. know, you fish in America in some of these lakes that are cram-packed full mm. of cutthroats, wild mm. fish. You know, there's so many of them in there. There's, you know, the, the locals you know, say to you, please take some, mm. because... There's too many. Thinning does. Thin, yeah, yeah absolutely. And they taste, don't they taste mm. great, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question that comes up a lot in my, mm. you know, conversations. For example, the sea trout now, 
have taken a bit of a dive mm. and the environment agency have a sea trout action plan on the south coast which goes right down to devon there's a great sand march project where we're tagging fish in the channel and seeing you know and they're coming from devon rivers right up to the itching and the test and it's quite interesting to see where mm. they're how the sea trout are moving around mm. but there's less of them mm. why we don't know but at that time you know at this time when there's a when there's a a dip in the population you know it's it's good that the the the, the i think the angling fraternity can say you know what i'm not going to take a fish and you know, until that population curve turns up i know me not taking a fish probably won't have an enormous amount of impact on the overall population because they're probably diminishing because of some much bigger issue but if you kill a hen sea trout, that's how that's many of eggs. hundred yeah. eggs, mm. whatever. So mm. you know that's yeah. the way my yeah. sort of. I guess these mind things works. are cyclical as well, mm. aren't they? In in some respects, and I know on our home river the tour last year was poor for sea trout, yeah. poor for salmon, obviously. Um, but this year it's going to be better. The initial we've had a really good smolt run mm. last year on the chalk streams, mm. especially the test and the numbers coming up. You know this in the in the in the salmon counters down at Nursling. Um, well, it was a really late run. They were mm. running up out of season, um, but when they came, when the water was here, basically they mm. came. You know, we yeah. had some great numbers. Yeah. So I'm, you know, you said how's the, I'm touching wood mm. that we, you know, the salmon are, you know, certainly on the up. The test has really held up. You know, it's been amazing to be part of that fishery at Testwood and Nursling. And still, you can go there and sight fish salmon. You know, you can watch them eat yeah. the fly. Yeah, that's where I wanted to come next. Actually, as somebody who swings flies for salmon, um, this is just completely different. You're you're in effect doing what you would do on a chalk stream, but with heavy bugs spotting the fish yeah. and seeing them. And it, and it's kind of interesting because again, for somebody who fishes spate rivers, um, that you're waiting for a lift in water for the fish to. On chalk streams, they're coming in, aren't they? And they're, they're pushing each other up the yeah. river in effect. Yeah, it's very that... much tidal. So yeah. they come in on the yeah. tide and they bump bump and gesture for position. And, um, you know, they'll sit on a lie for a while, for, for a long time, for a few hours. You know, who knows? Hmm. But in that period, you can see them. if you And they're surprisingly... Um, sensitive to noise and movement and you know they're like a sea trout they're mm. not stupid like mm. we would think growing you know as a nipper fishing on scottish rivers yeah and the gillies like wade in you know mm. i mean my spay casting isn't fabulous so i am a bit crash bang wallop you usually get it by about day three when it's time to come yeah. home you know <laughs> but it, interestingly fishing the chalk streams you can really see the behavior of the salmon and when you go back up to fish a spate river, where be it Iceland, Norway, wherever you've been lucky enough to, you, you, you always have that in your mind of how salmon react to your fly. How many follows you get without mm. them taking yes. is amazing. Mm. And that's electrifying to see, you know, I'll have a day fishing at Nursling and I'll have three or four follows and not catch a fish. But that's three that's or four enough. absolutely mm. electric. We yeah. call it a lift. We, you know, we lifted a fish. Mm. Electrifying moments mm. where you may have fished a spate stream somewhere and not had a pull and assumed that no fish had seen your fly. You know, mm. so interesting. How many follows you get, how many turn away, how you, if you slow the fly at the right moment or speed the fly at the right moment, it can induce the take. So it's like big boys check nymphy. Yeah. And are the fish tightening on the banks or? Yeah, they're they, right under yeah. the banks sometimes. Wow. So, you, you know, know, under your feet. So you'll see. Sometimes, you know, they're surprising. I mean, you know, the profile of a chalk stream is rather mm. different f from the Tay, for mm. example. Mm. You know, it, it's, uh, as I say, man made. So the bank tends to drop down straight from your toes into deep water. Mm. So those fish will sit right under an undercut bank, like mm. a peel mm. in a sea trout you know, on the outside bend of a mm. sea trout pool mm. on one of your home streams. Mm. They'll sit right in those tree roots, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's exciting. It's not for everybody. You know, you're not, you haven't got the grace and beauty of casting a spay rod. But, you know, you're poking about with a seven weight and a heavy bug and you're trying to generally roll cast that bug into nooks and crannies. 
and you know basically create a swing of a fly at a slightly steeper angle sometimes mm. vertical mm. so it comes up in the water mm. but generally a sort of 45 degree angle and you know you can't sometimes see the fish because you're in deep water although the chalk streams are crystal clear that fish might be eight feet down and he will see that fly raising up and suddenly he'll come into your field of vision out of the gloom they'll travel a long way for a fly in the the mood i mean there is now as strange as Mm. sea trout and salmon Mm. you know all of the rules you know people say right what's the best night Mm. you know what's the best tide to fish for a sea trout on and i say avoid a full moon because of the bright night, you know. Never mind the tide. I'm talking just first of all about the moon. And then one of my other buddies, well, Alistair Robgent, who mm. owns the tackle shop, a great sea trout fisherman in Stockbridge, he, say, he said to me, you know, I caught my biggest fish last year, 15 and a half pounds, in the brightest full moon of the season. So there are no rules and regulations. It's it, interesting. I had a lesson in that thinking about your fishing and perhaps sometimes overthinking it as well, in that I was still heading in Oregon in October and it was so hot. Yes. It was bright sunshine. As a salmon angler, I'm thinking... Yes. We caught fish. Did you? Yeah, we caught fish. And it's made me think, well, perhaps I don't need to fish in the gloaming for salmon. Yeah. You know, Emma and I generally, will just go, oh, you fancy a couple of hours, we'll go down. Gloaming. Yeah. And we'll go down and and go whenever and it's made me look at these things slightly differently yes. and um i think you know one of the things i've said about and this is why this is so interesting to me is one of the things i love about salmon fishing is the tradition one of the things i hate about salmon fishing is the tradition yes and so that's <laughs> why that's kind of really interesting to me targeting those fish and seeing that to learn something and there's a bit i fish on the tour where we fish up high and you can see i've seen how far salmon will come for a fly yeah and it's you know a lot further than you think yeah, sometimes. absolutely they don't always whack Very it aggressive. But yeah yeah it's extraordinary um so to learn a little bit about the fish their behavior that lift everything else is really interesting i know at home sea trout like a, a fish that's a, a fly that's been lifted yes they're a big fan of that and i can urinate those out when the water's just clearing down even in clear water absolutely mm. yeah and that's great i love doing that at testwood you know going sea trout fishing in the daylight yeah and sight fishing that's what i i catch all my sea trout in the day little trout mm. flies mm. you know sometimes they like it on the drop you know if you yeah. can cast into a slack where a sea mm. trout's fishing and put a mend in mm. to avoid the drag on that mm. fly and as that fly, sometimes a completely unweighted fly, is just slowly sinking through mm. the kind of meniscus and down in that first 12, 15 inches of water, you can just see the mm. fly going down. Suddenly the sea trout sort of nonchalantly move over to the fly and mm. munch it. Yeah. Bang, you strike as you see its mouth open. I sit and watch, and my friend Perry and I fished. Um, we went down one evening. And we thought, well, I'll go and see if we can find some trout and stuff like that. It's my home river, the tour. And I've caught lots previously like this, but we were watching sea trout rising for mayfly. Whether go. it's instinct, whether it's whatever, they're remembering something, I don't know. Yeah. But they were eating mayfly and we caught, I hooked a really nice one um, on mayfly, you know, a done. And that's one thing, you know, from our saltwater fishing and being lucky enough to be invited out to... America and the Caribbean and all those places and learning about the Grand Slam, you know, the tarp on the permit and the bonefish. And then, you know, being in that fortunate position uh, uh, 10 or so years ago to take on the stewardship of Testwood and Nursley. And we're like, hang on a minute, you can catch a salmon, a sea trout and a brown trout slam, yeah. and maybe a bass yeah. for the super slam yeah. in the same day yeah. on fly. Yeah, that's so, pretty cool. Yeah. So that's one thing that we have sort of pursued. And, and we've caught them on bombers, caught salmon on dry flies down there. Yeah. You know, so he, he, there's always that extra. Yeah, so I was saying we've, we've um, you know, a few of our fishermen, some of the younger guys really that have fished out in Newfoundland and some of that kind of uh, eastern seaboard of America and Canada, you know, where the bomber fishing for salmon, you know, that's so exciting. You see a big Atlantic yeah. come up and take a dry flight. You know, I'm talking about a dead drift bomber, not a, not a dragged or hitched. Wow. 
this is something where you're fishing a dry fly upstream and you know that you can see the salmon laying there or you know there's a salmon on a lie and you're casting a why would they come up and take a cigar shaped mm. piece of deer hair mm. you know what's going on yeah. it's now as strange yeah. as salmon and sea trout i think that's what keeps us coming back all the time doesn't it for more each time yeah. and wanting to try and understand them and i've got to the stage where i guess again from our backgrounds you know guiding people and stuff like that you have to have the answer but I think now, myself speaking, not guiding now, I'm just enjoying them for what they are. Absolutely. And truly awesome fish. But but chalk streams, what is it you love about them so much? Cool, that's a great question, isn't it? They, I mean, I'm fascinated by the unique ecology of mm. them. You know, the fact that the water basically filters through a giant chalk coffee filter. And they, you know, the old boys that taught me the the... the river keepers of yesteryear you know used to they said to me you know that the 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 water that falls before valentine's day in the in the winter rain is the water that you're fishing for when you're casting a fly during the mayfly it's taken that mm. long to percolate down through the berkshire downs and out of the aquifer you know and into the spring at the start of the river and way down to the upper or middle test you know it's months mm. so that's fascinating and it comes out you know it's it's a steady temperature you know eight nine degrees whatever um depending on where you are and how near so when you wake up in the morning on a cold frosty morning you look out the window the river's steaming mm. smoke on the water yeah, you know nice. it's, it, that is an incredible thing mm. And you, you know, so, and it's full of nutrients. It's a steady temperature all year round, given, you know, extreme summer temperatures, you know, out, out to one side for the moment. Um, the, the fact that, that it, it holds such a vast variety of fly life and aquatic weed, you know, that to me is stunning. You know, when you dip, you show, I mean, I like, when I teach somebody, I like to put in a, kick sample mm. there. I don't kick sample but I just scoop it around in the mm. ranunculus if mm. I'm lucky enough to find a bit the swans haven't eaten <laughs> um, and you know you pull it out like a tea strainer and it's crawling with bugs mm. you know and they've mm. never seen short of sticking your hand in an ant's nest or something you're not going to come out with that much life in that small pocket of space you know I don't think I mean you know the chalk streams are fairly unique in the capacity mm. of Gamma shrimp, for example, that they can hold in in a tiny, you know, space of water, and then you know the knock on from that is what 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 that's all trout food. Mm. So naturally, they can, if managed properly, they can hold a high percentage of trout and support a, a you know a high that percentage is the wrong word, but a high capacity of trout in comparison to some of the spate rough streams so that is one of the things i love and you know being by a chalk river is to me it's the birthplace of fly fishing mm. i love the history i love the being able to explain to uh, you know our friends from across the pond or people f that are brand new i love and, and this is going to sound maybe a little bit cheesy but i love the mindfulness of being on the riverbank of a chalk stream. Mm. I, lo I love the now, you know, watching. I don't have to cast a fly. I love being with somebody mm. uh, and just being on. I find it the most kind of, you know, how can I say? The, the, well, I guided a guy a few years ago. Here's a, here's a little analogy. He was a hedge funder. And the first time I guided him, he I taught him to cast at Avington. His first time fly fishing pretty much you know give or take and then over the years we guided together um, and I fished him and he you know I guided him and he got better and better and he bought more and more kit and his hedge fund got busier and busier and we went to Cuba together and he had his sat phone confiscated by the Cuban authorities because it was against Cuban law to have satellite communication and they gave it back to him on our way out and and then he got better and better. And every time I met him, he had a different sports car. And then it got red and then it got Italian and then it got really Italian. And then, you know, and he was just, he was an incredible economist, you know, Cambridge graduate. And I remember one day sitting with him on the riverbank 
and he, you know, we, we we were sitting watching this trout rise, and it just we couldn't make it eat. He was for eating little reed smuts. I had two trout boxes, you know, fly boxes laid down, and we changed the fly twenty five times, and it got dark, and we didn't catch that fish. You know, two intelligent men with a, you know, and a tr- and a trout with the brain the size of a petit pois mm. foxed us, and he came back to me and he said, you know, days later he said to me. That's the first time in five years that I haven't been thinking about my hedge fund. Nice. I was mm. thinking about that trap yeah, that, that beats us. Yeah, and that's what. But yeah, that's the love. Is it takes you to a different place, doesn't to it? Totally. A different level. And, yeah. and it, you, because your mind is full of something else, you're while you're by that river mm. and you're watching kingfisher fly or just the riffling water and mm. you know, look at it out there now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it it's just stunning, it's tranquil. Yeah. It's, it's it's a it soothes the soul. So, before we wrap up, uh, there's some other questions I want to ask you. But there may be, I hope not, but there might be some people listening saying, "Well, chalk streams, I can't afford to fish those." Is that true? Good question. Uh, it dep- You know, there's, there's never say never. There's always a way. So um, if you if you can't afford to, you know, send an email and book a day via one of the fishing agents obviously we're the best but whoever <laughs> you might choose to use um i mean our fishing starts at about 100 pounds i think we might yeah about 100 pounds a day per rod so um that is you know fishing probably on a wild trout stream somewhere might involve a bit of wading and ducking under and i can understand completely that that is out of that's width. not horrific though is it in the sense of for a day to fish no, a, no, you know if, it's it's a lot of money don't get me wrong but to say i've you've done it is yes it, it's chalk streams to me seem as though it's a place you've got to tick off as an angler i get you know the wonderful and i love the ewer in yorkshire and everywhere i love all of it i drove for the day from devon yes up to fish um Driffield beck in a day Lovely. you killed me yeah, I was jet lagged when I came home. <laughs> did but you catch so, it? Yes, I did. <laughs> jet, quite, it howls up there as well. That wind is. Yeah. But I did, and so it's all you make these trips. Yeah. Work for you, and if that burns, but it's not sort of, you know. I guess mayfly time is is more expensive, but either sides of those as well, and grayling come into it, and all those sorts of things. Yeah, and there's chalk streams you can fish for free. You know, if you mm. do the research, mm. I'm not going to tell you where they are, but mm. they, you know, there are yeah. stretches that you can go on yeah. a chalk stream fish for nothing. Yeah. You know, and some of them are getting some limelight now, especially mm. in the more urban yes, I don't areas. Know what you mean. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's also some incredible clubs you can join. You know, the Salisbury and District Angling Club, the Christchurch and District Angling Club. You know, v- venturing up to the more elite, like the Piscatorials and so on. Mm. That there's always a way. You know, not it's 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 if you're determined to do it and you put in the research, you can fish the chalk streams. Fantastic. So that's really good to hear that you know it isn't just the wealthy that get to fish these um, sorts of places that anyone can can have a crack on them, which I think is really cool. And you know, I think of sporting occasions and stuff like that that I'll I'll want to go to see if somebody play cricket at Lords or whatever it's a similar sort of thing and that's why I think the chalk streams have a, a special place in my heart that and, and being able to see the fish as well is deeply cool for me I think that's absolutely fantastic um let's round this off we've been an hour and nearly an hour and a half coming up um where you're so lucky you've got all these chalk streams in your portfolio that you can go take people fish on to fish on you obviously fish yourself is there somewhere that you still want to go visit that you haven't or somewhere you want to go back to? Oh, yeah. I mean, there always is, isn't there? <laughs> it's the sort of next piscatorial challenge. I love that. And I have to say, there's a tr- there's a trout stream in Iceland. I mean, the t- I think the trout in Iceland have been under um, sold for a few years. And there are some, there's some amazing trout fishing out there. And something about the Icelandic people and the place is quite mystic so i do enjoy i'm very lucky that i go back mm. there well I went, you know with brett yes. and, and nick last year it was amazing so um that's but i think uh yeah you know there there is a, there's an awful lot more to be discovered on on this river mm. but, you know the little corners and nooks and crannies my 
not my regret, but in having a life that revolves around f fly fishing and the s and that is seasonal around that, mm -hmm. the 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 annoying thing is that I am unable to disappear off to fish a worm fly hatch in the Florida Keys, which is in May. For tarpon, know? yeah. For tarpon mm. or all the other stuff that mm. he, he, you know. So I can't disappear off, you know, to Cuba in May when, the, you know, it's awesome saltwater fly fishing. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of stranded here because that's the, the path I've taken. Um, and that's when I make my money to feed my children mm, that sounds very fair to yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been really interesting the questions asked you have taken a really interesting route particularly from a conservation standpoint and i think it's been great that you've been upfront and honest about stuff as well and i think our listeners and i hope sincerely that they will see that coming through as well and from somebody who's lives and breathed the river, it's really wonderful to see and sitting opposite you, I can feel the passion and your love for these streams as well, um, which I think is to be commended, I have to say. Thank and, you. and to see that is is really, really cool and, and a passion about the state of the rivers and helping do something about them as well, which, again, I think should be applauded. So, Howard, it's been really great to sit down and talk to you and um, get a, a, a feel for how you feel about these rivers and a sense of your passion for them which is has been really really wonderful to listen to and I, I hope when people click the play on this that they felt the same as well um, so thank you so much um, it's been wonderful to nice one. to chat with you and hopefully we can find a grayling or two um, this afternoon as well but it's been really great so Howard Taylor, Upstream Dry Fly, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Um, I hope you've in enjoyed this podcast as much as me. Um, to remind you again that Fly Culture is, or the podcast here is an offshoot of our magazine, our quarterly magazine, Fly Culture. We're fiercely independent. We don't have advertising. We don't have advertorial um, we write about our love and our passion of fly fishing and I think this has been a this podcast has been a, as many of the others as well a great example of that so um, you can find fly culture magazine online um, at flyculturemag.com we're on the usual social media channels you'll find us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter as well we try and keep things updated our website we uh, give you a teaser of uh, previous articles from the magazine to have a, a read of and a sense of what fly culture is all about but i hope you've enjoyed this podcast as much as me this is pete tiger signing off from the fly culture podcast and look out for a new podcast very very soon <laughs>